Conference Championship week for most of the TVC, and it did not disappoint. We got to see some nets cut down in the TVC Ohio, but in the TVC Hawking, it only gets more intense after a meeting between the top two teams. Plus, we hear from a special voice in the Nelsonville York community on this week's Beyond the Court. Grab your popcorn because episode five of Hardwood Heroes starts right now. We've made it. It is the end of the regular season and the stage is set for tournament time. Before we get into this jam-packed episode, let's check out how the boys brackets look released last week by the OHSAA. First, in Division II, Region 7, the 16th seed Athens Bulldogs host a rematch against 17 Circleville, who they beat early in the season, 46 to 34. And Vinton County travels to a top three team in the MVL and the 6th seeded Sheridan Generals. Moving on to Division III, Region 11, 16th seeded Wellston seeks vengeance as they host Oak Hill, who they fell to earlier in the year, 60 to 51. The Marauders also welcome a familiar face as they take on Southeastern, who they beat 76 to 38 earlier in the year. Seven seeded Alexander welcomes in Belpre to the alley for the second time this year. The last meeting came on the first game of the regular season when Alexander came away with a win. River Valley travels to South Point, and finally, Nelsonville York travels to Portsmouth. And finally, in Division 4, Region 15, Southern travels to Eastern Pike with a date against the number one seed Trimble Tomcats on the line. Waterford hosts Notre Dame, South Gallia takes on Miller. Federal Hawking is also awarded a first round bye thanks to their success this year. And finally, Eastern looks to flip the script in the postseason as they travel to Paint Valley. And now we start the show with the Eastern Eagles and Eastern Eagles reporter Dylan Westmeyer. Jack, Eastern wrapped up the season with a trip to Belpre to take on the Golden Eagles. The Eagles have struggled on the road as of late, not having won an away game in just over two years. The Eagles' Eastern last win on the road was this on this very court February 7th of 2020. But the Eagles struggled shooting the ball, going to combine 16 for 63 from the field. On the contrary, Beaupre was extremely efficient, shooting 22 for 36. Defense for the Eagles improved after giving up 20 points in the first quarter, but it wasn't enough to end the drought as Belpre won 63 to 44. The gritty defense is a staple for Coach David Kite, who talked to us about what the future holds for the Eagles. So what I told them in the locker room now is, seniors have two guaranteed games left. How do, you want your, how do you want your career to end? Do you want to sweep your rival, beat Paint Valley, and play for a sectional title, which nobody thinks you will? And my underclassmen, how you do the next week, week and a half, two weeks, is going to tell me a lot about what you're going to do for us this summer. Eastern was able to kill two birds with one stone Friday night. First, they swept Southern, and second, they scraped by to get the elusive road win. The Eagles can carry this road win into their playoff game against Paint Valley Tuesday. Now we'll have to see how they carry that win into the postseason, but let's jump to the girls. How did they fare in their first playoff game? We retreated to a nail-biter in Lynchburg. The Eagles came out firing on all cylinders on the offensive end, with Sydney Reynolds dropping 11 points, leading them to a 19-17 lead at the end of the first. Lynchburg Clay came out in the second quarter with a stifling full-court press that completely shut down Eastern. The Eagles scored a measly four points in the second, leading to a halftime deficit of 27-23. Eastern came out of the half on a mission, playing better defense as well as unselfish offense. The Eagles cut the lead to just two going into the fourth, but could never get over the hump, losing 59-53. Despite a disappointing end of the season, Coach Jay Reynolds is enthusiastic about the team's returning junior class, though they will still need to prove themselves. You know, fortunate for us, uh, we do return a lot of players. I had a you know, coach I think very highly of in our league. He told me the other night, he said, you guys return the best players. And I, I looked at him and I said, yeah, we return them probably the best players, but will we have the best team? With no graduating seniors, the Lady Eagles could make some noise in the TVC Hawking next season. Yeah, it sounds like Eastern Faithful should be excited. Thanks for the great work, Dylan. And there's no better time than the tournament, and there's no better place to find all the action than on our social media pages. Check out Game Recaps on Twitter and Facebook, and catch the best photos and graphics on our Instagram. The games get that much bigger and you can find every second on social media. The path to the postseason has been particularly heartbreaking for the Federal Hawking Lancers. And to tell us more, we welcome reporter Maria Manessi. The Federal Hawking girls had a tournament game on Saturday, but leading up to that were multiple games to finish out their regular season. 
Despite their struggles this season, many of those games were winnable, which could help them to find success before the tournament. Unfortunately for the Lancers, they fell short. Federal Hawking started off strong, holding a tight lead. But the Lancers struggled to get the ball down low because Wahama held them to the perimeter. When the Lancers tried to force the ball in the paint, oftentimes it resulted in a turnover. Although they were able to hold the White Falcons to just 33 points, the Lancers weren't able to stop them in the final minutes. Crucial shots from Wahama gave them a four-point lead, and by that time, the game was over, handing the Lancers a 33-28 loss. A tough loss before the playoffs, but the Lancers still had a sectional finals game. How did that go? The Lady Lancers traveled to Easter Brown, who was ranked seventh in the state, and it wasn't pretty. Eastern Brown dominated all over the court. The Lancers weren't able to break the press and could not keep up with the Warriors. The Lancers failed to create chances for a score and cause a variety of turnovers. Eastern Brown took advantage of that, which led to opportunities of their own. The Warriors came out on top big 60 to 12. The Lancers knew coming in the game, it wouldn't be easy. Head coach Amos Cottrell talks about the mentality heading into the game. We just want to compete. We, we, we talked about it in the locker room that, you know, no matter what happens, let's play hard for 32 minutes. Um, we, we knew they were good. I mean, they've got eight or nine good, very good players. Um, so we just want to come out and compete today. We're trying to knock down shots. We, we've struggled shooting the ball for the last week. So. Moving over to the boys, their game against Tribble had TVC Hawking Championship implications. Yeah, it's a battle between the toughest teams in the Tri-Valley Conference. And to help us break it down, we welcome Trimble reporter Jacob Mata. Jack, this one lived up to the hype as a potential game of the year. The Trimble Tomcats and Federal Hawking Lancers were going after each other from the opening tip. The first quarter of play was physical as both teams were converting on and ones inside and making it rain from beyond the arc. Andre Crockwell started things off hot for Fed Hawk. He led them on a 9-0 run and gave the Lancers the momentum to take the lead at halftime 30-27. In the second half, these teams continued to go shot for shot. Blake Guffey dominated on the inside of the paint, making his last four shots in a row. Battling back came Fed Hawk. Leading the Lancers' charge were none other than Lane Smith and Crockwell. But in the end, it wasn't enough as Tyler Weber hits this shot to seal the deal for the Tomcats, giving them a 51-50 victory. Wow, an intense first matchup, but when will we expect to see these teams play again? Jack, these teams will meet again on Tuesday. If Trimble wins, they will take the TVC Hawking outright. If Fed Hawk wins, they will share the top spot of the Hawking with the Tomcats. The first matchup was decided by just one point, showing that this game could have gone either way. For the Lancers to win the next matchup, they will need to stay out of foul trouble and improve their performance from the line. For the Tomcats to clinch their share, they will need to be better about crashing the boards and securing rebounds. Coach Howie Codwell admits the team was caught off guard, but the boys have the knowledge they need to win the rematch. I think that they learned that they got a bullseye on their back. So uh, you got to be ready night after night. I think we took some things for granted that we probably shouldn't have. So we'll, we'll be much more prepared the next time. Got to give Fed Hawk all kinds of credit. I thought they played very, very well tonight. Tuesday may not be the last time the Tomcats and Lancers meet. Trimble and Federal Hawking both have clear paths through the sectional finals. In the district semis, Trimble may have a rematch against Waterford. Fed Hawk would most likely play Western. That would lead the Tomcats and Lancers to meet for the third time this season in the district final. Wow, now Jacob, let's stick with Trimble. I hear the girls had a tough out of conference game this week. Indeed they did, Jack. They took on the Division II Vinton County Lady Vikings. This game was electric from the very beginning. Both teams shot the lights out in the first quarter. Trimble made a lot of shots inside the arc, while Vinton County lived outside the arc, scoring 15 of their 17 first quarter points from long range. The second quarter seemed like deja vu as both teams traded buckets, but the Vikings took a 34-33 lead into the half. Coming out of the locker room, Jane Six dominated in the paint, scoring 9 of her 21 points and propelling Trimble to a 2-point, 47-45 lead. But with 8 minutes left to play, the Vikings were not done yet. They battled back in the fourth quarter, scoring 18 points and holding Trimble to just 6. Cameron Zinn dropped 8 points in the quarter, leading to a Vinton County 63-53 victory. If the Tomcats want to turn it around before the tournament, Coach Joe Richards says it will take teamwork. They outplayed us in every aspect of the game in the fourth quarter. You know, we're making too many mistakes when we have four or five senior leaders that need to do, do we need to do a better job, we need to finish. For us to make a run and to, and, to, and to share the conference, we need everybody playing together all the time, all the time, all the time, team, team, team. And 
we kind of fell apart there in the fourth quarter. So we'll go back to the drawing board and we'll keep working tomorrow. Jack, Trimble has lost three of their last four games to end the season as they prepare for the tournament. Yeah, we'll have to see how the Tomcats can bounce back, especially with a share of the TVC title on the line. Now let's break down the TVC Hawking standings, starting with the girls who do not have a champion yet. Waterford holds the one spot, but Trimble has one more chance at a share of the TVC title in a game against the third place South Gallia team. Everyone has one game left, but that will not change the standings. Eastern finishes fourth with Bell Free, Federal Hawking, and Southern ending the standings at five, six, and seven. And now crossing over to the Hawking boys, these standings are also finalized except for the TVC championship game against the top two teams, Trimble and Fed Hawk. Excuse me, Trimble, Federal Hawking, and Waterford and South Gallia meet up to end the season, but have seemed to secure their spots at three and four. Bell Prix ends the season at five, while Eastern and Southern close out the final week of the standings at six and seven. And we also saw a lot of good games go down in the TVC Ohio, and we welcome Meg's reporter Max Minge to break down the week for the Marauders. Thanks, Jack. It was a historic week for the Lady Marauders, who were looking to carry their momentum from last week's big win over Alexander. There was no let, there was no letdown for Megs as they played host to the Athens Bulldogs. The defense picked right back up where they left off, wreaking havoc and forcing seven turnovers in the first quarter alone. The suffocating defense tallied 17 total turnovers, leading to a number of fast break opportunities. This Marauders team shines in the open court with their unselfish play, especially when Mallory Hawley is handling the ball. She sees the entire court and hits her shooters in stride, allowing Megs to take advantage of fast break play. But when she has an open look, she is not afraid to take it. This has led her to become the new all-time leading scorer in Lady Marauders history. Meg's got to celebrate this victory along with a 48 to 35 dub. The Marauders have rattled off nine wins in their last 10 games. Meg has only lost in the last 10, the Vinton County Vikings. The Marauders have defeated each opponent by at least double digits since the loss. Meg's have impressive wins over Eastern, Nelsonville, York, and Alexander. It is the perfect time for this team to heat up with the tournament less than a week away. And now it sounds like the Lady Marauders are ready to make some noise come postseason, but Max, it seems like the boys are going in the opposite direction. That's right, Jack. Just as one team rises, the other team starts to fall as the boys have become to struggle late into the season with losses in four of their last five games. Now the Marauders were able to hang with the TVC leading Vinton County Vikings leading all the way to the fourth, but that's when the Vikings were able to go on a run and secure a comeback victory on the Marauders. And now, it sounded like the Marauders had that game secured. What happened down the stretch? Well, Jack, the Marauders dealt with foul trouble, allowing 24 free throw attempts throughout the contest. The fouls led to easy points for Vinton County, so Megs was forced to start full court pressing. By the fourth quarter, the team was visibly tired. The physical play took a toll on the Marauders, who seemed to be out of gas. Megs' fatigue caused the lead to slip, and they couldn't recover, dropping the game 62 to 50. Max, it sounds like the Marauders are going to have to turn it around quick if they want to make a run in the tournament. That's right, Jack. Meg's first round matchup is set for Tuesday against Southeastern. And we saw most of our fans voting Vikings tonight as 64% of Vikings County emerge, saw them emerging as the victors. As always, you can head to our Instagram to cast your votes for who you think is going to win throughout the week. The loss set Alexander and Vinton County up as the last team standing for the title. Now most of our fans showed their Viking pride, expecting them to take home the title. Now that we saw what the fans anticipated, let's move into the biggest game of the week out of the TVC Ohio. Taking over at the desk is Alexander reporter Shane Scalfaro and Vinton County reporter Cole Patterson. Yeah, Jack, it was a big week for these two teams. Starting on the boys' side of the things, it was a highly anticipated matchup with game of the year potential and performances from D'Arcino and Radabaugh delivered. Vinton County holds the lead in the TVC Ohio, but look to play spoiler. With a win, Alexander would put themselves in the driver's seat and clean sweep the Vikings. While the Spartans started off hot early on, the Vikings flipped the switch in the second quarter. Eli Radabaugh got the team back into form and back within three points, leading to a halftime score of 35-32. Alexander came out of halftime looking to finish out with a win. Kyler Diagostino did what he does best and had a scoring fest putting up 30 points and hitting 13 for 19 on the night. Vinton County started to bring the game back into their control, and they did just that in the final minutes of play. The Vikings got into a rhythm and even held a lead for a short time before the Spartans surged back in final moments. Diagostino received the ball, drove down the court, puts it up, and he misses. Oh, he's got it. He puts it in, giving the lead with 5.5 left in the game. 
the Vikings defense, or the Vikings offense tried to score, but the Vi uh, Alexander defense held strong with a win. So Cole, moving over to the girls' side, the story wasn't so hot for the Spartans. You're right, Shane. Vinton County has won the TVC Ohio title the last four years, and spoiler alert, they did it once again, making their dynasty five in a row. The Vikings knew they needed to win, and they started the game off electric. Tegan Bartow and Cameron Zinn started the scoring, and they never eased up on the Spartans. Alexander didn't have an answer for the VC defense. Star duo Marley Grinstead and Karen Meeks had trouble getting the ball to each other, and the two were contained all night. The Vikings held the duo to a combined 28 points, shooting 10 for 27 from the field, leading to a halftime score of 32-15 in the Vikings' favor. Alexander continued to struggle through the second half as the VC defense, along with the fouls, kept them frustrated. The Vikings blew past Alexander to win the game 53-33 and clinch the TVC Ohio title in the process. We spoke to Coach Jones about what this team meant to him and his team. Thank you guys. It's, it, it was awesome. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun, and uh, and uh, you know these girls have worked so so hard, and you know we took a loss early in the season, and uh, and it was, it was just so much fun to watch them work and keep competing, and, and you know we you know it's like I told them we controlled our destiny, and we just kept putting the work in. I'm so proud of this team, and I'm proud of how hard they fought, and it was it was a fun it was a fun night. Vinton County extends their TVC Ohio title streak to five in a row. After head coach Rod Bentley retired last season, Brett Jones took the job and this team continued right where they left off. Coach Jones led his team on a 13-2 run to end the season to keep this team moving in the right direction. Nets have been cut and now their sights are set on the postseason. Despite the loss, the Alexander girls rolled right into their first postseason game this week. Shane, how were they able to bounce back? Jack, this team turned themselves around and had a very different showing this game. Coming off their loss to Vinton County, the Spartans needed to get back into form ahead of their first postseason game. Karen Meeks and Marley Grinstead had a mission, get connected early. This duo combined for 39 points and 9 rebounds on the day and were the key leaders on this team. The Spartans got scoring from every starter and a combined team effort led them to a win 52-46 over South Point. This team held out even when the pointers started to bring this game back, and a hard-fought win like this could prove they can make a deep postseason run. Vinton County's first playoff game will take place Monday against McLean. It sounds like these should be two teams to watch in the postseason. Thanks for the great work, guys. And now that the girls' regular season is wrapped up, let's check out the final week of standings. We start in the TVC Ohio with the champions, the Vinton County Vikings. After falling to VC earlier in the week, Alexander places second. Nelsonville York finishes third with Megs and Athens ending the season at four and five. And finally, River Valley and Wilson close out the standings at six and seven. And now passing it over to the boys of the Ohio, Alexander cut down the nets and won the conference outright with Vinton County falling behind them. Megs, Wilson, and Athens are all tied for third place with a six and six conference record and all having split each of their appearances. Finally, it's River Valley and Nelsonville York closing out the standings for the TVC Ohio as they place six and seven. And as the second half of our season intensifies, our trip beyond the court holds strong. This week, we focus in on Nelsonville, York, where the Buckeyes have a history of using the microphone to enhance the game day experience. Host of Beyond the Court, Curtis Fader, takes us along on this journey. Basketball games are exciting, but in order to feel the energy of the game, one needs the voice to match. Haley Dupler, one, two. Three-point goal! The Buckeyes have had a history of legends on the mic, and they continue to make games pop today. One of them is broadcaster Jim McCumber, a man who has called Buckeye events for over 40 years. On the PA side of the coin, Steve Cox has been announcing for over 15 years, and those two go way back to when they were kids. There was a field up by my house where we would all play sports. Kids would get together, but I was young, a lot younger than the other kids. But Steve always made sure that I got to touch the ball once in a while and, and uh, always protected me, making sure the bigger guys wouldn't knock me around too hard, that kind of thing. And, of course, then you don't think about that. But looking back on it, you know, you really appreciate it. And in order to fully grasp commentating a basketball game, I tried to pick Steve's brain a bit. I usually try to get here about a half hour before the reserve game, yeah. try to hunt down the opposing uh, varsity coach if I can, see if they've got a roster that I can... Uh, get that roster, copy my names down. Have you ever said anything that people criticize you for? Like, hey, don't say that again on the mic? No. Two-point goal! 
Mackenzie Hurd. Buckeyes. No, not really. I haven't, uh, but uh, that's good. Clean record. Yeah, so far, yeah. Yeah. After watching closely, he gave me the nod to take the call. You ready to do this? I'm not as prepared as you are, but I might just have to give it a shot. Oh, no. Heard is the word for two. I'm in Olivia Spielman's house. Emma Fields comes in and double zero for Jackson. Emma Fields enters the game for the Buckeyes. God, there's so many numbers. If that was a roller coaster, that'd be Splash Mountain. Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand for Hardwood Heroes, Heroes own Curtis Fader doing a great job on the microphone this evening. <laughs> McCumber has had his share of accolades, including his induction into the Nelsonville York Hall of Fame. With him and Cox still going strong, the voice of the Buckeyes are in good hands. But what about the Buckeyes on the court? To learn more, we welcome Tanner Watts to the show. Yeah, Jack, the Lady Buckeyes got their tournament run started Saturday against the Northwestern Mohawks. Our Lady and McKenzie Hurd stepped up when the team needed it the most in a memorable, memorable playoff performance. And how did the Buckeyes do in their first tournament game? Early in the first quarter, McKenzie Hurd reached the 1,000 point mark. It was a huge morale boost for the team. With McKenzie Hurd on the bench, the super sophomore Aria Levy stepped up with 18 points. Broken Richards was 5 for 5 from the field, scoring 10 points. And Hurd had herself a night with 12 points, 7 assists, and 7 rebounds, despite, despite sitting most of the second half. Defensively, NY was amazing. They held Northwest without a field goal in the second quarter. With these performances, Nelsonville. Nelsonville York had a very dominant 49-27 win over the Northwest Mohawks. And looking ahead, who will the Lady Buckeyes play next? Nelsonville York will be looking for revenge against the third-seeded Fairland Dragons. These two teams played earlier in the year with Fairland came out with a 51-42 win. And now transitioning over to the boys, they had a chance to sweep Athens for the first time in 14 years. Yeah, Jack. The Buckeyes came in full, fully healthy for this game, and Athens struggled in enemy, enemy territory with being only 1-7 on the road. The Buckeyes fell to the Bulldogs, so what went wrong for NY? Several Buckeyes found themselves in foul trouble with three key players having more than three fouls. Another factor in the game was the turnovers. Athens was able to force 20 turnovers with seven in the last two minutes. So what's on the Buckeyes' agenda for next week? They will, not, they will have a lot to clean up before the first, first round tournament against the Fort Smith Trojans. I spoke to head coach Blaine Gabriel on what they needed to do. We got shut down on some turnovers, but you know, defensively, I, you know, we stayed in that zone. I thought that was the right thing. We missed out on some rebounds, and like I said, towards the end of the game, we had some turnovers that really hurt us. We just got, and the other part of it is we got to get some, through more shots. The MI boys hope to improve defensively and have better ball control moving forward. It'll be interesting to see how the Buckeyes can build off the loss heading into the postseason. Thanks, Tanner. <laughs> And you can see all the action shots of the Buckeyes and all the teams in the TVC by heading over to our Facebook page. From the court, to the sidelines, to the stands, we've got you covered. Get up close and personal with every shot, from every spot, for every game. Head over to our Facebook now for our very best shots. And you just saw photos of the Athens Bulldogs, and to take us through the story behind those photos, we welcome Athens reporter Caleb McCluskey. Well, Jack, the Bulldogs travel to Alexander Friday. Going into this game, Athens was hoping to sweep the season series against D'Augustino and the Spartans. However, the Bulldogs are 2-7 and seven on the road, while Alexander is 5-2 and two at home. And so, Caleb, how did the game end up going for the boys? Well, Jack, this is a game that was within Athens' grasp to get the upset. However, the Spartans pulled away with it later in the game. Early in the game, Athens was able to get the lead behind the incredible scoring of Derek Welsh. By the end of the first half, the Bulldogs were leading the Spartans 28 to 21, and Welsh had 16 of their 28 points along with 10 rebounds. That sounds like an amazing first half for Athens, so what happened later in the game? The Spartans were in complete control in the second half. All of the momentum was in their hands when Alexander was able to go on a 14 to 2 run to gain the lead for the first time in the game. The leader of this run was Alexander's Kyler D'Augustino, who was a major contributor in the third quarter. After this monumental third quarter by the Spartans, Athens was not able to get back into the ballgame, losing to Alexander 57-46. And now moving on to the Lady Bulldogs, I heard they had a playoff game on Thursday. Yeah, Jack. The Athens hosted the Lady, uh, excuse me, Logan Elm Lady Braves in the play-in game for the sectional semifinals. Now, how did the Lady Bulldogs do in that one? Well, Jack, both teams were extremely inconsistent on the offensive end for the entire game. For Athens, they only shot 19 of 75 from the field and 1 of 13 from beyond the arc. 
Cassie Federfield was able to lead the Bulldogs in scoring with 12 points. She also tallied five steals. Haley Mills also chipped in with eight points, 11 rebounds, and three steals of her own. However, on the defensive end, the Lady Bulldogs were able to pick the Lady Braves' pockets 23 times. The game ended with Athens on top, 45 to 15. So Caleb, their next game is against state-ranked Fa Fairfield Union. What can the Lady Bulldogs do to have a shot at winning against this powerhouse? They would need to improve on their shooting both from the field and the free throw line. From the free throw line, Athens will only then make four of their 11 attempts. Free throws are a crucial part for teams to win ball games, especially in the tournament. Yeah, and there are a lot of competitive teams this year. Yes, it will be interesting to see how Athens tries to pull off this upset. And Athens and Fairfield Union last met two years ago when the Bulldogs fell 62 to 28. They meet again on Monday. Also in Division II, Region 7, River Valley has a similarly tough matchup on the road against Warren. Megs hosts Circleville with the winner likely taking on Sheridan, another state ranked team. And finally, Benton County hosts McLean at home in the sectional finals. Moving to Division 3, Region 11, a division that started with five teams has only two left after losses to Wellston, Eastern, and Federal Hawking. Alexander's victory over South Point pushes them to the next round where they will meet New Lexington. Nelsville York also moves to go head to head with Fairland. If both, if both teams can win their games in their respective matchups, they will face each other. And finally, in Division 4, Region 15, Southern's victory over Clay sets them up with a game against conference opponent, the Trimble Tomcats. Belpre moves on and will take on South Webster, who they battled with last year, where they fell 72 to 56. Waterford with Take, will take on Glenwood in their first postseason contest. And finally, South Gallia still has to host Green, a team they lost to in the tournament last season. Now that we've seen the breakdown of both, of both boys and girls tournament brackets, it's time to announce our heroes who finished the regular season strong. Starting with the boys, the decision between the two all-stars was so difficult that we had to take to Twitter and ask our fans who the heroes should be. After gathering 54% of the votes, our first two-time boys hero this season is Trimble's old reliable Blake Guffey. When the title is on the line, you have to go to your best player, and Guffey consistently makes it known why he holds that title. Guffey finished the game with another double-double with 25 points and 16 rebounds. Guffey was nearly perfect from the field, shooting a nice 69%, making 9 of his 13 shots. But it's not just his ability to score that gives him this title. Guffey has been a great playmaker, having an unparalleled ability to find the open teammate, and this game was no different as he tallied seven assists, and he also had clamps defensively as he grabbed two steals in the final seconds of the game. Talk about a lockdown defender. And while the boys saw a familiar face, there is a new girl who takes the throne for Girls Hero of the Week. In what was considerably the most important game of the regular season, Tegan Bartow proved herself to be one of the biggest assets. Barto was locked and loaded, finishing with 21 points, shooting an impressive 8 for 16 with five of those coming from beyond the arc. Barto proved herself to be one of the most important players on the floor, but she wasn't only a monster offensively. Going up against the number two team in the conference, Barto did not shy from the contest. She pulled in five rebounds and also stepped up defensively, swooping in for two steals. Time and time again, Barto has proven herself to be a crucial piece to this championship run. Now the performances this regular season have been unreal, but now begins a new chapter. Regardless of the end of the regular season, everything becomes that much more important. And it is time for the TVC heroes to step up or step aside. And we will have all the coverage on WOUB, and you can also follow along on social media platforms. But until then, from all of us at Hardwood Heroes, we're reminding you to be heroic.